thank you everyone for logging in. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, especially at this inaugural event. So I'm hoping, I hope to make it worth your while to log in, but looking ahead, I've seen the program of the number of speakers and they're really fantastic. So even if, even if the level today isn't great, the slope is amazing. So you guys should come back, whomever's online for the next few weeks. Um, okay, so this paper is done with Salim. Salim will be in the Q&A in case there's clarifying questions as you go along. And it's called Jump Starting an International Currency. And the starting point here, so let me start with the, before we jump start to the paper, let me tell you our starting point. And the starting point of Salim and I was really reading Barry Eichengreen's work for now ooh, a few decades, where he's been telling in, through a series of books and articles, he's told the story of how is that the dollar went from circa 1910 being 0% used outside of the US borders to, as you all know nowadays, accounting for, depending on the measure, something like 70% to 90% of global transactions in the world. And the story that Barry tells or documents um, and what happened is that, you know, you start in 1912 where the dollar is already the world's largest exporter, um, but um, all trade finance that involved exports or imports in dollars happened in London and was denominated in sterling, okay? And then why do we pick 1912, or even better, Barry picks 1912, because 1912 is, of course, the, fame, the, the date of the Federal Reserve Act. Um, and the Federal Reserve Act not only delivered what we're usually used to talking about the Federal Reserve Act is through the founding of the Federal Reserve. It led to stable inflation, stable interest rates, stable exchange rates. But on top of it, and very importantly, the Federal Reserve Act deregulated significantly the U.S. financial market. In particular, it allowed U.S. banks to open branches abroad. So U.S. banks, and so far as a lot of the financing happened in the London market, U.S. banks could now open branches abroad, starting there for being able to supply trade credit and potentially denominating it in dollar to all of these U.S. exporters and importers that were active in the international market. Moreover, not only deregulated, but Benjamin Strong, the first president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, was extremely active. I mean, if you look at his memoirs, he spends as much time with this as he spends with the whole inflation um, and interest rate stuff. Uh, he was extremely active in the so-called trade acceptances market. And so what was the trade acceptances? If I was importing, if I was a U.S. company importing rubber from Colombia or from Chile or from somewhere, then, you know, I often would want to borrow against that input before I was able to produce my output and sell it. And the way I borrowed it was by pledging as collateral the input that was on its way to me. Uh, and, those, and these were called the trade acceptances because this was collateralized, if you want, by this, that input. Well, trade exemptions were very important for international trade. And this, again, London was the key market, but Benjamin Strong was extremely active in creating the regulatory framework, as well as intervening directly in that market, to create a liquid market where a bank who was lent to a U.S. importer or exporter could now go and sell that claim to other banks and interbank markets or even to other financial intermediaries. So much so was this intervention that the Fed, had ex explicitly, in particular the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, said we will be a buyer of last resort of these if their price, if the interest rate, if you borrow in dollars for export-import businesses, gets too high. And this was a very aggressive buyer of last resort. I mean, um, some studies show that around 1924-25, the Fed held as much as 50% of all trade acceptances. So this is not just this last resort was a frequent resort. Uh, when you think about the buying that it was doing. So that's what the Fed did by in, norm, in a very sharp period of time. By 1925, the dollar was already very large. Again, depending on the measure, somewhere between 10 and 30% of, of uh, credit was already happening in dollars. And of course, by 1945, it is the dominant currency that it continues to be today. Question, was this because of these policies, the Federal Reserve Act I highlighted? Was it luck? It just was luck insofar as you know, a war broke in London and that had a huge effect on the London financial market. Or was it even just inevitable? The US was on its way to become the, world, the, credit, the main credit of the world. And if you're the creditor, maybe you impose the terms of which you're willing to lend to the other. So this is kind of the background we were starting from the work of very prominent international economic historians. Salim and I instead, we've been, we were looking at the China and we were looking at what's happened to the Remibi. And here's a little bit of a very, very brief story of the Remibi in the last uh, 11 years. In 2009, the Remibi, the China was the largest goods exporter, was already the large world creditor, 
And yet, its currency was not used at all. It wasn't used at all because given capital controls, you really couldn't use it. But then if you look at starting in July 2009, the Chinese government, especially the People's Bank of China, started adopting a series of policies. And let me just list some of those, and they're purposely right next to the ones that the Federal Reserve did in the 1910s for you to see the parallelisms. It started by great deregulation. You could now settle trade claims, starting with this pilot scheme in July 09, settle them outside borders. And now there are several places where you can settle claims outside of China uh, related to trade. It came almost as importantly with creating a secondary market for the equivalent of trade acceptances and credit, but generally for payments in RMB. And this is, of course, the Hong Kong offshore market that uh, for RMB, um, which really sprouts around 2010, 11, and others. It was, of course, a stable exchange rate through the dollar peg that has been there for a few decades. And finally, it came also with a buyer of last resort, in this case, through the PBOC swap lines. Why do I call this a buyer last resort? And not to get into the details of how those swap lines work too much, but essentially, because I'll, I'll talk about more of that later, but essentially think about them. What they do is if I'm a firm in uh, Thailand and I'm importing um, goods and de inputs denominated in RMB, well, then my bank will, I will want to get a loan from my bank in RMB. Well, what the PBOC swap line with the Bank of Thailand does is that my bank is comfortable that it can sell, offload, if you want, give to the, to the Thai to the Thai central bank this credit and the Thai central bank is willing to buy it because it immediately then uses the swap line to send to, if you want, get the RMB against it uh, and from the PBOC. Okay. So you see this is a direct intervention essentially to make banks in Thailand, in South Africa, in whatever other country, Argentina, that assign these swap lines, they can be much more comfortable in lending in RMB because they have now the spire of last resort by uh, their central bank, but ultimately by the PBOC. Outcomes, by 2016, the IMF included the RMB in, the, in its basket. By 2019, it's a roughly the RMB is 2% of foreign exchange reserves. So this, these policies are better. This time was a successful time insofar as the RMB went from zero to being arguably an international currency. Was it a coincidence that the same policies led again to a country jump-starting? Was it just luck again? Was it, um, um, yeah, were these policies active in it? That's basically what this paper is about. And this is what the next, uh, I guess, 40 minutes I'll be telling you about. Okay, well, that's what we're trying to do. What are we going to do? We're going to make two contributions to this question. We're going to write a model where firms choose both the currency which they sell, but importantly, they're choosing also the currency of the credit they get. In particular, the trade they use for their working capital, the trade credit against their inputs. We're gonna focus on writing a model where there's gonna be three thresholds. And these thresholds are the thresholds such that a company in South Africa would like to indeed sell in RMB as well as get, trade get uh, working capital credit in RMB. And those three thresholds are gonna be thresholds one, on whether borrowing in RMB is both cheap and liquid. Here, what I mean by liquid is simply that the uncertainty on the interest rate that you face to borrow in RMB is low enough. Second, that the exchange rate between RMB and, say, for again, I'm in South Africa selling to Nigeria, uh, the exchange rate between the Nigerian Naira and the RMB is stable enough. And third, that the costs of the non credit goods, of my domestic input costs, so again, if I'm in South Africa, those would be in RAND, and the RMB is the covariance between those is high enough. So there's gonna be three thresholds. If you clear those three thresholds, then companies in South Africa will want to start using the RMB for their invoicing and the credit working capital. Crucially, is the complementarity in these two choices. That if you choose more RMB for invoicing, you want to choose more for working capital, and these two are going to feed off each other. And that, if you want, is the key economic mechanism that we're going to be trying to introduce here to the literature. Then, importantly, central bank policies, that is essentially these policies over here that we wanted to make sense of, they are going to, what they do is, they're gonna make, they're gonna increase the liquidity, they're gonna make the credit borrowing in RMB cheaper, the pulse of the PBOC. In doing that, that's gonna encourage more RMB uh, borrowing, that's gonna lead to more RMB invoicing and so on through the complementarity of these two, okay? So that's what the model is gonna be. The contribution is these thresholds. 
we're not going to be going after the question of is the RMB going to become a dominant currency or not? We're going at the other extreme. How do you go a currency that goes from a model that where, why does the currency go from being zero used to being positively used by firms outside of its border in their dealings, not with your own country? So again, in my example, South Africa selling to Nigeria. Okay. So that's the first half of the paper. So second part of the paper is going to use exactly these PBOC swap lines. They were signed between 09 and 18. Why? Because it turns out that um, the PBOC didn't sign these 38 all at the same date. Rather, you know, it signed the one with South Africa, if I remember, in 2015, but the one with Nigeria in 2018. So we're going to essentially try to exploit the variation across countries in time of when did they get an RMB swap line, both variation. Some countries got the swap, these RMBs, some didn't. Uh, some got in 2018, some in 15, some in 11, and use that variation to see whether this policy indeed contributed through the lenses of the model to the RMB being used by the countries involved. And the findings are, is going to be that it did, it was helpful. These policies, very consistent with, again, the writings of Barry Eich and Green for the US and consistent with our theory. But using now the RMB, we're going to find that indeed in the linear probability model, the chances that South Africa used the RMB went up by 20% on account of the swap line itself. Okay. Briefly on the literature, a lot of really great papers on why the dollar with different mechanisms becomes a dominant currency. We're focusing on the other extreme, like I said, not why currency becomes a dominant, but the complementaries that make it go from zero to being positively used outside its borders. We're going to rely a lot on the currency invoicing literature, which is very much about given a marginal cost, you want your price to essentially mimic in a way that'll make precise your marginal cost. It's kind of seminal work by Charles Engel, uh, Gita Gopinath, Ovid Skocky, Robert Rigo Bond. The key here, here is that you're also choosing partly the currency of your marginal costs because you're choosing the currency of your working capital. And so you can have this two-sided complementarity that's going to be, if you want, the novel theoretical element here. Third, we're going to, the literature is very much emphasized, again, the currency invoicing. We're going to, there we're not going to innovate at all. The innovation is on this focus on working capital. And here we're particularly close, I think, to two very recent papers from the Bank of National Settlements, Yun Shin and Valentina Bruno and Aaron and Malamud, Again, emphasizing the work gap and also relying a lot on, um, say, work that Mattia Maggiore or Jesse Schrager and others have done, emphasizing more the finance side of um, currency denomination. In our case, like in these papers, the financing of the working capital. But whereas that literature is mostly emphasized the dollar, we're going to see, hey, to what extent are people actually borrowing and lending in RMB as well, uh, in this case, in the jumpstart. Finally, lots of papers on RMB, not, not lots of papers, but a few papers, especially this great paper by this political scientist, McDowell, on the policies of the PBOC. Um, we're going to contribute essentially a model and an empirical test um, to try and make sense of this. Some work on USD swap lines. Me and Salim had worked some on that. Let me just say, I don't really want to talk too much about the dollar swap lines unless people ask me the questions. Let me just say that they're totally different animals. The dollar swap lines and the RMB swap lines, they're, they're in some ways, it's like talking about mortgages versus collateralized corporate bonds. They're both loans, they're both collateralized, if you want, but they're just very different in terms of what they do, it turns out. Um, and then finally, on the empirics, a lot of work on currency choice using disaggregated firm-level data for a country in a short period of time. We kind of go the other way in that we're going to have all the countries in the world, not, so our level of observation is the country, but we have the whole network because we're going to use this data from SWIFT on payments across borders, and we're going to use payments rather than invoicing. So it's really going to be the flows, uh, the payments that get sent on and off. So um, for our question, it was important to have it because, again, there's no firm level variation that's relevant for us. The relevant one is the cross-country variation. Um, and so that's, that's why the country makes sense of that to you. Okay. I can stop here for questions just in case anything has come up. Um, no not, questions right now. I think you can super. keep going. And I'll proceed from that. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. Now, oops, there we go. Model, so let me present to you the model. So keep an eye on this box. This box is gonna keep on showing up. So this is a model which is gonna be a continuum firms indexed by J. That's gonna be on the horizontal thing here. It's gonna be in the unit interval. Think about this again. This is individual firms in South Africa, okay? Each firm sells to a bunch of markets. That's the vertical axis. This is South African firm choosing that sells to Nigeria, Angola, Portugal, England, Argentina as well. So those are in the vertical axis. Importantly, the South African firm sells also to the dominant currency, D, and, and 
the rising currency, which we're going to call R. This is not a coincidence, D for dollar, R for RMB, instead of calling it rising versus dominant. Okay? So all the other markets it sells are here in the vertical axis. The actual axis that I equals one or I equals zero, this is going to be the dominant, existing dominant currency. And this is the currency that the market matching the currency that isn't so used but may get used at some point. Okay? So that firm's market's small of any kind. Now, the firm, each individual firm has to make um, a couple of crucial choices. And so we're going to frame this into three periods in a simple three period model to highlight the mechanism. The two crucial choices of currency are done in period zero. And they are one, do I want to borrow in the rising currency or in the dominant currency? Now, we're borrowing here to have working capital, right? To get your inputs for production. So we're going to see that when you borrow in that currency, you're borrowing it to buy the inputs in that currency. So you're going to be choosing essentially the composition of your inputs, which are going to be either XR or XD. That's the novel choice in this paper. Standard choice is you're going to choose LCP versus PCP, but also the other option is rising currency pricing or dominant currency pricing. Okay? You know the average interest rate, you know the relative cost of inputs. But what you don't know, and what you'll only learn in period one, and that's the uncertainty is, you neither know the exchange rate, which is very relevant for this pricing, but also you don't know whether by borrowing in at this period in dominant currency versus rising currency, which one is going to be more expensive. You're committing exactly the technology of financing, but then exposed, you need to actually do the borrowing, and you don't know exactly what interest rate you're going to face. Okay? In this period, you borrow to exactly, again, buy these inputs using the technology you've chosen um, because of the working capital. You're then going to sell your goods. You're going to pay your borrowing. Um, we're going to repay the debt and distribute the profits. The second period is completely mechanical. So if you want, you can collapse into period one, by the way. Uh, we find it useful just so that kind of fix ideas. But this is really the fact with two-period model since all the uncertainty realized in period one. Note that the structure we're comfortable doing the two period because you could put this into an infinite horizon DSG because essentially then this would mimic what we see in the working capital DSG in New Keynesian literature. First period shows the technology against the price, then you do the borrowing which you pay after. This would be a morning and night kind of setup in those type of models that in principle we could frame ours in. Um, but we're not going to do that, but one could do that exception. Okay? So period zero, let me put some equations to it. You're choosing this tech, you're choosing ADA according to this, meaning you, are, you know you're going to produce next period, you're the Jade firm, combining working capital X and other inputs L. You borrow against X, you don't need to borrow to pay for L. But you are choosing ex ante where that X, this technology, is relies on rising currency inputs or dominant currency inputs. Inputs that you're going to have to borrow R against or inputs that you're going to have to borrow D currency against instead. And so if you choose 8 equals 1, it means that you're going to have all your inputs are going to be R inputs. If you choose A equals 0, they're all going to be D inputs, D currency inputs, in between a mix of R versus D inputs, if you want. Okay? Um, yeah. So that's the key technology choice, this ADA that I was telling you that you have to choose a period 0. Um, extension. What if you could choose to get R inputs but borrow using D currency against them? We consider that in a robustness section. It turns out there's a very strong force here that if I'm importing R inputs, I want to borrow in R, meaning if I need to pay for the inputs in R currency, I want to do working capital in R currency as well. So here it's assumed that the two are the same. Likewise, we do an extension where we do just any homogeneous degree one production function in case you guys get hung up on the call numbers. Next, standard choice. Do you want to set your price according to but if I, again, South Africa, do I want to choose it in the rand, in the currency of my export market, the Nigerian Naira, in dollars, in RMBs? Knowing that, if I set the price in my currency, that means that for each unit I sell, I get the P I chose. But if I do it in the foreign currency, then my revenue, given that I set the price in my local currency, then in the local currency, in the export good, then I'm going to have to multiply that by whatever the exchange rate to get the, the, the ones I have. Okay. Then, likewise for dominant, exchange rates here are going to be exogenous. This is where I said this is a small open economy if you want partial equilibrium model of these firm choices. In particular, all these exchange rates, there's actually a continuum of them, it's SI, are going to follow a log normal distribution uh, so that we can focus on for a second moment. We've also done this again on um, 
without the log normal assumption, uh, where for any general distribution, and then we do everything with second order approximations and you get the same results um, without these. I'm gonna make one assumption for the presentation. It's really not important. This, the log normal is pretty important, or the second order, that's how we're gonna derive things. This one is not. Um, I'm gonna assume that the rate of depreciation as well as the variability of the dominant and the rising currency are the same. Why? Because if they weren't, then every expression will have an extra term that involves that obviously you wanna borrow in price in the exchange that wants to, that's gonna appreciate more or the one that's less volatile. We thought that was, again, this was such, so obvious that it wasn't worth carrying that in every expression. So we're going to set this equal. Also, for our empirics, since the RMB is pegged to the dollar, this is approximately true in the empirics. So again, we thought that generality wasn't really needed. Um, and so that's why we did that. Okay. Then, period one. If you borrow in dollars, that means you have to borrow Q and you pay one. But if you borrow in the rising currency, you're going to have to pay epsilon and the epsilon stochastic. Meaning, borrowing in D is going to have no uncertainty. Borrowing in R is at an uncertain interest rate, or at least a period one, you know what that is, but a period zero, you didn't know what that was. Obviously, what matters is the relative. We could have made the borrowing in D uh, stochastic as well. All that matters is the relative. So we're going to focus instead on this G distribution. I know there's a distribution of potential cost of borrowing in the R currency, um, but at period zero, when I chose that I was going to go the R way, I didn't know exactly what interest rates they were. Okay, I knew I knew distribution, the average, the moments, but not exactly the realization. To pay for the inputs, I need to pay for the working capital. These are these rows. So again, I need to borrow to pay exactly this amount per unit of input, and then I also need to pay for my non-credit capital. I'm going to set these working capital prices to be um, again um, they're exogenous and they are uh, known. We can make them stochastic. Really, will make no difference at all. Uh, important, slightly more important because it's going to show up in the propositions, we're going to allow for the non-credit input to be stochastic. Um, and in particular, like with all the other prices, log to be log normal. So it's going to have some covariance with the D currency and the R currency. So again, here I'm in South Africa. I'm going to have to pay for some stuff, which if I imported them and chose the R currency, I pay an R currency. But I also pay for lots of other stuff. The price of all that other stuff, <clears throat> think of it as a measure of, say, producer price index or a measure of just input costs that combines both stuff I paid in my RAND, the local currency, but also I may have you know, imports in dollars because I import oil, say, and oils in dollars. There's gonna be some variation of that with a dollar as well as with the RMB, okay? Putting it all together, what's my marginal cost of production? One minus alpha of the stuff is paid in this W. Alpha of the stuff is the working capital. If I choose 80 equals zero, then that's dollar. What does that mean? I need to, borrow one at the price one over QD dollars to pay rho per unit times SD so that I express my marginal cost in terms of my South African rand. Likewise, if I do in the RMB with the new bit here that the price here has this volatile component. Okay. Then period two, this is perfectly standard. We're going to have constant elasticity of demand. So if I price at LCP, I set this price, this is the demand. If instead I price say in uh, the rising currency, then in units of the rising currency, then I have to multiply by essentially the rising currency relative to the Nigerian currency, which since are, these are the bilateral with, the, with my South African currency, I need to do the ratio of them to translate that. Again, we've done an extension for a general demand function that has strategic complementaries across sellers. I'm not going to cover that in these uh, 50 minutes. Okay. So then combining it, what's the profits if I say do LCP and there's an equivalent expression for all the other regimes. I set my price in the Nigerian Naira. This is how much there's demanded. That's my revenue. As a result, multiply that by the Rand Naira exchange rate. This is how much I collect in South Africa. I pay the cost in my domestic currency times how much quantity I sold. That cost is this expression that depends on my choice of, the, of working capital, depends on the randomness of the exchange rates, on the costs, and on my interest rate. Okay. Crucial, this is the crucial expression in some ways um, in the following sense. Here, again, building on the shoulders of Charles Engel, Gita Gopinath, Elliot Skorky, Robert Arrigo Bon, um, I mean, Dima, Mokin, many others in this literature. The key problem is that these firms are risk neutral, like standard risk neutral profit maximizing firms, but they would like ideal perfect information to have a constant markup over the marginal cost. Because of all this risk, 
any deviation from the optimal, you know, theta over theta minus one markup is going to mean lower profits. Therefore, they want to be choosing the currency denomination to try and match the currency of their sales with the currency of their costs so that they're as close as possible to that optimal desired markup. And it's going to be all about the risk here for the firm is to deviate from that. And that's the problem that it's trying to solve. Okay. As is works in this literature. Okay. Finally, what is the policies we want to choose? Remember back to my introduction, if you still remember, we're going to have all these deregulation policies. What do we think about them? Well, they're essentially shifting the, the interest rate in the rising currency to a new tilde distribution, such that the old one first or stochastic dominates it. That is, they lower the variance, they lower the average in borrowing it in RMB. The swap line is a, just one example of these policies. What does the swap line do? It says that, look, you can always borrow an RMB via your bank, via the central bank, via the PBOC at a fixed cost, epsilon swap, let's call it. Therefore, once you introduce swap line, what you do is for the right, hand, the right tail risk of borrowing in, um, in, um, in RMB gets truncated by the presence of the swap line. Okay, so essentially it is a particular transformation, a particular way of, again, going to a, a, a distribution that involves less risk in this first source acid dominant sense. Okay, so that's what the, and the insight of the whole lender of last resort literature is even if this does not get used very often, and indeed the swap lines of the PBOC have not been used very often, it's not used to set determines whether they're being effective. Their effectiveness comes, like in any other lender of last resort, by the fact that they provide provide right tail insurance, but it's sometimes they do get used. And so they can be very effective in exactly triggering credit as Benjamin Strong did in the 1910s, as the Bank of England discovered in the 18th century with Badgett and the whole lender of last resort literature. So that's the model. Any questions on the model? If not, I'll proceed to the predictions. Yeah, so uh, Pierre-Olivier Gurinshaw had a question. He wants you to, um, could you say a bit more about the stickiness in borrowing decisions? How hard is it to switch borrowing currency in reality? Or to put it differently, if there's stickiness in borrowing decisions, is there still a UIP condition in the background between the different interest rates and exchange rates? Right. So this, so in terms of our model, we're not going to impose UIP. Uh, so that's just in terms of the model. It could be there or it could not be there. Crucial. So that's just in terms of, in terms of clarification on the model. In terms of the... Um, um, the important question here is, so imagine that we had not UIP, but say CIP. If we had CIP holding, then, and it held exactly, then it wouldn't matter which currency you're borrowing because you can always uh, change it to some other currency, uh, to whatever currency you want using, using uh, for contracts. So, that, so if CIP existed, then this would be mute in terms of what currency do you want to borrow. If there are CIP deviations, then you do indeed makes a difference which one you pick but still, if there's a positive CIP deviation, even though I'm borrowing an RMB, if I could use futures to turn that into sterling, then that CPA deviation would be just the extra borrowing cost in some ways. Now, in the case of the RMB, there's essentially, there's very few, it's extremely hard to borrow in forward markets against RMB or it's extremely expensive. So you can think about this as de facto, if I were to borrow another currency, if I wanted to switch from RMB borrowing to GBP borrowing or something else, this would be prohibitively expensive, right? And so you can think of our assumption that you're borrowing one or the other as being those costs, those epsilons, are either the direct costs of borrowing in RMB, or they're the cost in borrowing RMB plus, or sorry, the cost of borrowing in say pound sterling, plus then the extra CIP cost of borrowing the term for in the RMB. Now that's a very, very large number. So de facto for at least the empirics, it's as if uh, there's essentially not a CIP condition or it has a very, very high, cost and so you would focus then on the on the cost on that end okay anyway we can come back to this in the q a that's very important right it's the extent to which you can borrow uh in which currency so here think about because another way to think about the swap lines of course what they do is they put a ceiling on cip you can think about them what they're doing is saying well even if you're borrowing gbp but you want to convert that into an rmb how expensive is that now the PBOC, the facto is, in this case, is not putting a ceiling, but it's actually creating almost such a market because you can then use the swap line to do that currency uh, move. Okay, good. Model predictions. Manage my time. Okay, model predictions. 
first prediction is one straight from, again, it's cocky if you want um, Gopinath uh, Rigobot, okay? But applied here, and especially applied for this threshold problem. And that is, first, imagine a firm that chooses RMB working capital. Will that firm ever choose uh, DCP? And the answer is no. I mean, I have my working capital in RMB. I have my, I have paid for my other inputs in whatever currency that is, the W. I'm selling to Nigeria. Why would I ever price anything in dollars? Okay. I'd always prefer to price in RMB because if nothing else, I'm matching my invoicing currency with my working capital currency. Second, when do I do that as opposed to picking, say, the, the, again, the Nigerian Naira? Well, I do that if the variance of the local exchange rate, the Naira exchange rate with the RAND, is um, such that, sorry, so the variance of that is sufficiently high relative to the RMB variance. Why? If you're above this threshold capital phi, then I'd rather match the, 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 the RMB cost of my working capital to the, my revenue rather than match the demand that's coming from Nigeria. Okay? And so, yeah, so that's why that, that works out that way. In terms of time, let me skip to the other ones. Um, look, if alpha is equal, this is immediate if alpha is equal to one, because in that case, I mean, this always holds the fact equals to one, because then your working capital is the entirety of your inputs. So if that's the entirety of your inputs, you want to go and match your revenues and your sales to the cost of your inputs. And so you always choose RCP instead of LCP. You can see that if alpha is equal to one, this always holds. Okay? But if not, it's going to depend. Third, when do you prefer then RCP to PCP? Well, you do it if, well, I'm a South African firm. I, I, I have two forces here. I want to price. Do I price in the cost of my working capital or in the cost of my other inputs? Well, if my working capital and my other inputs are correlated enough, then I'm happy to price it in terms of the RMB. And that is if the sigma is above this threshold omega, which obviously depends on how important the working capital is in the first place. And that's on the value of alpha. Proposition. What about for credit? The new choice here. These are the PCP, LCP type of analysis. But what about the choice of ADA? First result, ADA is bang, bang. You either all want all your working capital to be in R or in the D currency. You never want it in between. Why don't you want it in between? Well, you don't want it in between because again, you're a risk neutral firm. You want to maximize your profits. You want to go for whatever is the cheapest thing there is. And so you end up with this very, it essentially comes from the quasi convexity of profit functions with respect to um, um, cost of the inputs. When do you then choose one as opposed to zero? You will choose it if this, the cost of borrowing an RMB according to this particular expression is low enough relative to the average interest rate cost, the average cost of the working capital inputs, and this threshold psi. That threshold, a very neat thing about the model we've set it up is that it's the same for all firms. It doesn't depend on the firm J. Okay? It depends on, first, if you're, let me go through the larger. If you are selling a lot in RMB, you want to also are more likely to want credit in RMB. That's the complementarity. Second, if the RMB market, if China was a big market for you in the first place, that is immediately a strong fundamental attracting pull for you to want to do this, your credit in RMB. In other words, if I'm already selling a lot to China and I'm pricing to China in RMB, that puts, regardless of whether to Nigeria I'm pricing RMB or not, that is in itself a strong reason for it to do it. Finally, thirdly, if the covariance between, again, my, the RMB in, uh, um, exchange rate and the costs of my other inputs is very high, again, that creates this force for me wanting to denominate working capital in RMB as opposed to the dollar. If you then combine these two propositions, the length of the proposition, you end up with our key proposition for policies. What happens if you shift the distribution of credit costs, if through liberalizing your financial markets, if through policies such as the swap lines or such as Benjamin, or essentially just more generally buyer of last resort, if you um, uh, lower the, make this market more liquid in the sense of first arc acid dominance, although you see already, the key condition is whether this animal here on the left, this expression falls. If that is so, then let's work sequentially through what happens. If I was uh, already choosing work capital in the R currency, this has no effect on the choice of RCP. 
This is the fact that here, this condition didn't depend on eta, okay? Second, for, so first stop is if I was already selling, if, if I was already um, getting capital in R, then do, does that change the way I want to price in Nigeria? No, the outside of confirm. But go the other direction. Keeping fixed the fact that I was already invoicing in some currency, whatever that was, in Nigeria for my South African exports, if I'm a South African firm, this shift means that if I cross that threshold, the firms that do cross this threshold here, for which the shift means is now below the PSI, those shift to RMB credit. And then, and only then, for those who shift to the RMB credit, then as long as, given that I shifted to 8 equals 1, the lemon now applies, if I'm above the phi and omega thresholds for those i will now switch to rcp and now given that i've switched to rcp then we go back to b that switch in rcp lowers the psi more makes me want to get more r credit which in turn leads to more r invoicing which leads to more r credit okay and that's where the complementarities kind of work out okay so let me do this with my picture we started here south africa is south african firms a lot of them are invoicing partly in dollar in some markets, some of them in the local currency. They're invoicing in dollar for Nigeria, they're invoicing in peso, say, to Argentina, okay? We lower, we have the central bank policies, the central bank policies leave you across the threshold. That threshold is up at J star. Some firms now find it more, find it cheaper, if you want, cross the threshold such that they want to now borrow in our currency we move now this vertically to the right. Of those, then, some of them, precisely because they're borrowing in R, they want to now price in R. And that, that is this threshold that comes from the thresholds in lemma one. So what you end up is a world in which a majority of firms in South Africa are still having credit in dollar and are then pricing in either dollar or pesos. But some firms in South Africa now borrow for the working capital in RMB, and some of those, will now price their goods in RMB, that's the vertical side, while others price in whatever local currency there is. The area here is the usage of the RMB, both in payments sent and in payments received, okay? Now, if, however, it was the case if the covariance with the non-credit input, think about, again, the PPI, the domestic cost was low, same idea, but instead of going RCP here, you would have done PCP. Still note that the policy leads to an R usage but now it's just to the thickness here. You're borrowing in R, but you never price in R with the exception of the Chinese market, okay? If, however, the covariance is high enough, this purple thick line becomes instead the square, okay? If, in turn, by the way, that covariance rises, well, that's gonna push this to the right, the J star to the right, that to the complement arrows changes the IR star, and the area increases by this amount, okay? So that's what the proposition tell you. So model makes four empirical predictions. One, there are, even though there's 200 currencies, so a little shy 200 currencies in the world, very few of them international. Why? Because for most currencies, you're above the thresholds. You have a relatively volatile currency with, other, with exchange rates with other currencies in the world. You're small, here I am, I'm in uh, Nigeria, I have my Naira. Uh, I'm small in the input basket because I'm not so big in terms of the sales of British firms or of uh, French firms or others, and it's really expensive for you to get borrowing in Naira because there isn't the depth of financial markets that exist. So if the Nigerian Central Bank introduced a swap line with Nigerian Nairas, they're so far from the threshold, that wouldn't matter at all. No matter what policy you do, you're just not going to be an international currency. But if you're the PBOC and you already have a currency that's relatively stable with the dollar and thus peg to the dollar is also stable with other currencies, if you're already a big exporter, such that a lot of countries, a lot of firms, lots of countries already have, are already uh, paying for inputs that are coming from China in RMB potential. And you have started the Chinese Hong Kong market. And on top of it, you now lower the cost of credit with a swap line, then you can get a jump start, And you can get a bunch of these Nigerian firms that want to use RMB credit and to invoice to the Nigerians of the world in RMB. That's the first prediction. Second prediction, if I sort countries by this covariance within the RMB and Nigerian, uh, Angolan, British, uh, um, other input costs, 
then those for which this is higher are the ones for which we'd see a higher policy on our usage. They're the ones to which you will see more of the firms wanting to invoice and to get credit in RMB. And finally, imagine that I'm in, in, uh, in Nigeria and South Africa signs a swap line. Well, because I have South swap line and I actually import quite a bit from, from South Africa, in Nigeria, the Sigma RW is gonna rise. That is, if my neighbor signs a swap line because they start using more RMB, me in Nigeria, I wanna start doing more RMB invoicing as well, as well as RMB credit. And so these are the four predictions that, including the model, I'm gonna turn now to the data for. Let me present the data. I won't stop you for a question just so that, because we're about 10 to 15 minutes from me stopping. And so I'll just do the empirical, the data and the empirics, and then we'll do the discussion if that's okay. Is that okay, Rob, or were there a lot of questions? No, that's perfect. Just keep going. Great. Data, very simply. Here are the data on the swap lines, both number and amounts, growing since 2009. No swap line has been reverted, so this is monotonically increasing. How much? These are pretty big by now. Very, very big in terms of amounts. Um, as big as, say, the maximum usage of the dollar swap lines of the Fed, um, including in the last month. Um, how are they signed? Just so you get a sense, there's time variation. We ordered here so that the color is the ones that also come with more uh, flows between China and those countries. 2009, there were only a few. Crucial one with Hong Kong to start the, the Hong Kong offshore market. And this is how it looked. This is how it has expanded over time. Okay. So now a lot of countries, ECB, a gigantic one, Hong Kong, but also Uzbekistan, Suriname, and a bunch of others. And I, I, I think I checked Nigeria and South Africa should be here. That's why I picked them for the example. So that's our first data. We collected the date, the exact date per month of when each one of these were signed um, across countries. Um, the PBOC makes this a little hard, so it takes a little bit of work to collect this, but again, uh, happy to share those dates, or actually they're in the appendix of the paper. Then we're gonna use the SWIFT database. So SWIFT essentially, you all know, when you send money across borders, almost always goes through SWIFT. SWIFT is a messaging service between banks to say, reliable source A, bank A wants to send to reliable bank B. Uh, we have monthly bilateral data for the entire world. So essentially what I have is how many payments went in August of 2015 between Nigeria and South Africa broken down by currency, okay? For every month over year. This is, for those interested, you can get that data from SWIFT. Uh, it's available to other researchers as well, okay? Crucially for us, I have it broken down by currency and I have it, uh, at a monthly frequency and for the whole network of the world. So I can exploit this difference of when different countries adjust it or not. Okay. Uh, so my key measure is going to be the RMB share in cross border non FX payments sent and received per month per country. Just very briefly, non FX is very important. This data often is dominated by the closing of a series overnight repos in currency. So it's important that you look at the non FX payments and it's broken down by that. Otherwise, they'll swarm a lot of other data. Here's the aggregate data against also the swap lines. The RMB, you can see jump started, meaning it used to be essentially zero and it goes to 1%, 2%, roughly 3% by the end of our sample that it's used. This is on average across the different countries. Okay. Now, if you look at the first thing we did, of course, is plot the data. Here's the share of the RMB payments. And here I did an average 2010 to 18 against the share of China trade. Obviously, if you do a lot of trade with China, Mongolia here, you're going to do a lot of RMB payments. But what really struck us in this picture is some countries, uh, this is the 45 degree line, uh, some countries you trade a lot more than they use RMB. This is the fact that RMB again is not a dominant currency. For the dollar, you have the opposite. Most countries use more dollars than they trade with the dollar. But crucially, look how many currencies are here in zero. And so this is the share across the period. Essentially, a lot of the action of the data is that a lot of guys start from zero and change to positive, okay? So if you were to run a regression on shares, which we did, but I won't, I think I won't show you, uh, I won't have time to show you. The focus really is not the intensive margin. The focus is the, really the extensive margin. All these countries, they went from using zero to going to the right. That's what dominates the data. As a result, we're gonna focus precisely on non-rich countries um, because non-rich countries may have, again, financial, there can be financial trade so that we can focus on this kind of working capital firms invoicing. We're going to focus on non-rich countries, and there all the action is, do you go from here to there? That is, do you start using the RMB at all? Okay? So here's what, here's kind of, if you want, picture of um, prediction of the model, if you want. 
This is the median RMB share in cross-border payments. This is month before and after countries sign a PBOC swap line, okay? For the ones who signed it, for those 38. And here is kind of the, you know, graphical way to see the paper, the empirics, sorry. You didn't use the RMB, you sign a swap line, you start using the RMB. As simple as that. The effect is, seems persistent, if anything, gradual and delayed. Um, it seems that there's a clear extensive margin switch around here. So in a sense, if you're kind of more of a graphical guy, that's the empirics. It does seem that consistent with proposition two, you sign the swap line, you start using the RMB. Okay? So anyway, you can stop here if you don't care about regressions or other things. But let's do regressions and things. In particular, there's one key concern, of course. And the key concern is reverse causality, meaning maybe something happened that meant that you want to use more RMB because that same thing that meant you want to use more RMB also meant that you want to sign a swap line with China. I don't know. Maybe your people in your country started really liking Chinese goods. If they really like Chinese goods, they have to use RMB to pay for them. At the same time, because your country is now so friendly towards Chinese products, you also called up the central bank and say, let's sign up a swap line, even if these swap lines are totally useless for RMB usage. Okay? That's really the, the, the key concern. Okay? There's some unobserved fact that drives both RMB usage and that leads to sign a swap line. We're going to deal with this in a bunch of different ways. I mean, that's all the econometrics for that adds to uh, that picture. First, if the factor was common to the country, if again, just I'm more, I like, my country likes Chinese things, both currency, credit, and goods more than others, then we'd have, um, oh, sorry, I, I started the other way around. Then we'd have some country fixed effect. On the other hand, if this is just the whole world switched to kind of liking more Chinese things, both swap lines and payments and goods, then there would be dealt with the time fixed effect. So we're gonna have the time and country fixed effect. More than that though, uh, imagine the fact of some region specific trend due to trade with China or some, again, political friendliness to China or productivity in relation to China. We're gonna use the share of RMB in my neighbors. So I signed the swap line, how much RMB was being used by them to see if that's what led to the takeoff. Next, may, let me use a bunch of measures listed here of how much I trade with China to try and control for maybe you signed a trade agreement with China. And that's the third admitted factor. Next, let me do Chinese policy. Very important here. Is there an RMB clearing bank? Are you a member of the Asian Investment Bank? Or are you through the Belt and Road Initiative all of a sudden getting a lot of money from China investment? This we thought could be a very big deal. Maybe you just, there's a lot of investing road and belt, uh, sorry, belt and road in your country. That's why you signed a swap plan and that's why you're having all these things. So we're going to control for that as well. So we're going to do essentially fixed effects and all these controls to try and deal with that in our first approach. And so here's the regression. It's a linear probability model with the fixed effects and with all the controls I listed. And then this is a dummy variable that essentially switches on when you sign the swap plan. So this point 28 is if you want it, the direct map to this picture here. Once you do all the controls, you get a very solid, if you want, and so far as it doesn't seem to change a lot with all these controls, 13% impact of signing a swap line to you going from not using RMB at all in payment center received to the problem that we observe that you see the RMB payment. Okay. Second approach, let me manage my time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take five more minutes. Okay, organizer, sorry. I'm, should finish within a minute, but I'm going to take five minutes. That's okay. Um, second approach for the reverse causality. Um, but again, maybe I should have spent more time on this, but again, we're trying to control for anything that we could think of that leads to an admitted factor that leads to more payments that come from RMBs. Um, and that'd be leading to you just signing also a swap line just as a political posturing measure, if you want. Second approach. So swap lines almost always get signed when there's a state visit, when Xi Jinping goes and visits your country, okay? That's just how these things work. You sign that together with a bunch of other things, okay? So our idea, well, Xi Jinping visited South Africa in April 2015, but the state visit in Nigeria was in 2018 instead. Let's look at the variation. Let's say, well, even if there was a submitted factor, the fact that you visit South Africa a year or three years before you visit Nigeria, that often, the state visits were not organized to sign the swap line. They're often organized with a lot of randomness having to do with agendas and calendars of state leaders. Let's use the time series variation of when the state visit happened to, as an instrument to when you sign the swap line. So the first stage is enormous, which again just reflects the fact that when you sign the swap line, when does the state visit? That's when they actually sign the agreement. But arguably, our point is that the data which that happened 
that is somewhat exogenous to whatever other uh, factors could affect it. And so if you do that, if you do now an IV regression using the timing of state visits, you get, if anything, actually a larger effect of the swap line on the, uh, sorry, of, yeah, of adopting the swap line on the probability that you have the pain. Third approach, which is both an approach to the reverse causality as well as a prediction in the paper. Uh, remember, the papers predicted that if, Niger if South Africa signs a swap line, that, that raises the threshold. That means that Nigeria now wants to use more RMB as well. So let's do that. Arguably, South Africa signed a swap line is, was, that's exogenous to whatever is going on in Nigeria. Nigeria didn't control the fact that South Africa chose to sign a swap line. So you're going to see whether, not the fact that you sign a swap line, but the fact that your neighbor signed a swap line, we're going to use that as the variable in the linear probability regression to see what happened to your RMB payments, including, again, um, both for all countries, also excluding countries that have the swap line. So I'm now going to be looking, so I really like these ones. I'm going to look not at Nigeria, but at Angola, or I, I should have checked it. I think I'm going to say Mozambique. Mozambique does not have a swap line with China. Did the fact that the neighbors of Mozambique, Angola, Nigeria, signed a swap line, do we see Mozambique all of a sudden using RMB, even though Mozambique itself has done nothing with China at all, as in signing a swap line? And the answer is yes, you do. You get, as you'd expect, a smaller effect, a small predict, but you still see that Mozambique starts using the RMB uh, just because South Africa signed a swap line. Okay? Final bridge of the model, if we sort on covariances, sort on the correlation between the RMB and the countries of the PPI, you get some of the effect that you'd expect. That is, that if the stronger is the correlation the, for the high correlation versus the low correlation, you get a larger effect. Um, the, the sample falls quite a bit, though, because our measures of this W, which, again, we use PPI, we only have them for a few countries. We've done this excluding China. We've done split between payments sent and received. We've done it using, again, shares plus lean probability. We've done it where you look at immediate effect in the first 12 months, this is after. All of these are to see whether this is just being driven by China or whether this is all kind of this null of it was just political posturing, the swap lines did nothing, and the results are consistent with the theory. So to conclude in my remaining two minutes, um, what is that we did here? Um, we try to study to what extent whether a currency not becomes dominant, but goes from being, you know, South African RAND, nobody uses it unless you're having relations with South Africa. Nigeria and Mozambique do not use the South African RAND when they negotiate with each other. Um, how do you go from becoming an international currency? And we observed during the last 10 years, the RMB. Moreover, we observed that, and because both we have greater data and because of the swap line exogeneity, we can study it because so many of the policies that it did were the same policy that the dollar did. We can study to learn about generally whether these hypotheses that economic historians and others are made about the dollar in the 1910s, 2000s, can we test those? Can we learn about the RMB? Can we learn about international currencies in general? We wrote a model emphasizing precisely because we wanted to study these policies, emphasizing financial markets and working capital credit. Why? Because these policies are directly about being able to borrow in the currency. Our model, the key force was this complementarity between credit and invoicing and these threshold results. That you go from zero to positive once you cross thresholds. So you get this in the same way that the dominant currency literature often has thresholds such that you become dominant, we have thresholds of when you go from zero to positive, if you want. Um, and they're all about this complementarity between the credit and invoicing, such that the policy jumpstart them. What do the swap lines do? They were just our application. They're very nice because they give us this exogen, this variation that allows us to test these things that are incredibly hard to test. All these dominant currency or just currency of choice are very hard to test. We get that exogen, that those variation that allows us to test them. I tried it explain to you what these things do, essentially remove right tail risk of RMB financing, and that indeed increased by 30% of probability. Finally, what does our paper our empirics tell us about, about will the RMB become dominant or not? And the answer is they tell you nothing about that. <laughs> Meaning, you know, our model, of course, you could now use it to see to what extent does, um, if you want, the, this gets so big that the red line goes zero and the RMB overtakes the D, we drew this here, you really, since it's 3% or 30%, you should really have the red line more like here. We were studying the emergence of this little rectangle over here. Again, it should be much, much smaller if this was drawn to scale as opposed to drawn to, for you to understand. Um, we don't know, but it's, we think it's kind of, I don't know, we learned something about when do these purple rectangles show up in the first place. 
um, in that way. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. And I guess, yeah, we'll open up to questions, I think. All right. Great. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. So let's see here. Uh, what we're going to do for questions is we have a number of questions in the question and answer. Um, if you have any more questions, you can submit them to the question and answer. Or if you would like to ask a question live with voice, you can raise your hand right now. I think the best bet to start would be to take a couple of these questions in the question and answer chat. So I'll hand this over to Salim who can read the question uh, and then you two can answer this. So let's do two of those questions and then we can try to take some live. Okay, so thanks very much. I'll just read them out. Bacardi, you want to jump in first, that's fine, I can, I can answer them. Uh, so the first is, uh, could you clarify the social cost of um, central bank policies uh, to jumpstart this currency, is there any Good question? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I, I missed you there for a second. Sorry, Salim, my connection. Oh, sorry, okay. The question is, could you clarify the social cost of central bank policy to jumpstart its currency, if there is any? Ah, okay, great question. So Salim, I'll answer this one, but you should feel free, to, again, next one you should yeah. answer as well, okay? But I'll answer, I'll start with answering this one. Um, and so the answer is um, not within, not strictly within the model, but we could easily by extending the model a little bit, or at least, by putting the model with, uh, within a model of um, then the financial markets itself and uh, where the exchange rates and the interest rates are not exogenous, but either endogenous. And what do I, and, but let me discuss what that would look like. We haven't done it. It's perfectly doable starting from what we've done. Um, let me tell you what I, what I think are the key considerations. Key considerations here is that, right, let, let me start with actually an example of something else. Forget about the swap lines for a second. Imagine that all the PBOs, all the Chinese, let me say the, the Chinese government did, was subsidize RMB credit. For each RMB that uh, anyone, for each loan that anyone borrows in RMB from a Chinese bank or somewhere else, the Chinese would, the Chinese authorities would give you 10% or something, a direct credit subsidy, okay? Now, if you had a direct credit subsidy, that works in our model, that's a beautiful thing, meaning you can study it exactly, at least do exactly the kind of same things that I've shown you, right? Uh, meaning you would jumpstart your currency potentially insofar as you've now the, the distribution shifted literally horizontally, literally sideways if you want, because all you've done is shift the whole of it to the left as opposed to the truncating the right tail, but you still have that effect. Now, if you've done that though, that would be effective. You would jumpstart it. You'd get similar effects to the ones I discussed, but potentially this would be unbelievably expensive, right? If you think about all the credit that comes in RMB, you're now having to subsidize all of it you're just, it would be an enormous amount of subsidies that the, that the Chinese government would have to pay to all of these companies all over the world. If you look at the volume of trade flows, it would really be inconceivable, right? So that clearly, it seems that if once you add a little bit of risk or, or even, I mean, it seems that obviously you wouldn't want to do that, right? Or at least that it, it doesn't seem hard to say that that policy would be wrong. With the swap lines, it's more interesting, right? Because what you're doing is cutting the right tail risk. So in many ways, insofar as you cut the right to only uncertain this distribution, it could be that it never, if you never get a shock to push you to the right tail in a, in a small sample, let's say, the Chinese would, this would appear like it's a free lunch. I mean, you get essentially the same jump starting and you never, the PBOC actually never makes, never lends out a single RMB. Okay? That would start there. That would appear like a free lunch. It appears like a free lunch because you're in a small sample. You're only, you've only had realizations within never hitting the right tail. And so all you've done is remove perceived uncertainty. Now imagine that you have some realizations going to the right. Well, then it depends on how aggressive you were in cutting that tail, like Benjamin Strong, super aggressive in the Fed, PBOC not so aggressive actually, that hasn't been so used, and it's an expensive swap line still, uh, um, quite expensive actually. Um, and so as a result, you've only cut some right tail, so that's gonna cost you some. Then how much does it cost you? Well, it costs you essentially the integral given the distribution the expectation that you ever cross that tail. That's how much it's going to cost you in some ways. Moreover, if you lent it, but you then got it back, then that cost would be relatively small. But now say that third case, you end up a lot of the times on the right tail that you truncate it out. And on top of it, very often the foreign central bank doesn't pay you back the RMB. Then you get, start getting very close to the subsidy case in the beginning. Okay? So just in terms of just generally how much does the country lose or not, it's going to depend. You, essentially what you want to do is put in the model, then the G distribution is going to be endogenous. How often you end up in the right tail is going to be something you're not just going to statistically potentially measure, but also is itself going to be affected by the how successful the policy is or not. 
and then you could go and answer that question. That's it. Okay. Um, so the next question, uh, as a trading firm, how do you access uh, the R or D credit? Does this require working through branches of R or D banks, or do all banks have access to currencies through foreign exchange markets? I mean, uh, let me just say a few things about this, and the card will chip in afterwards. Uh, so in the model, I guess we kind of abstract from where the trade credit comes from. We have this exogenous cost uh, of accessing R credit, which is this G function, so some sort of financial friction on accessing uh, trade credit, and that drives things that Ricardo uh, talks about. In terms of the actual R swap lines, it's kind of interesting in the sense that you know what, what the PBOC does is it lends um, money to the foreign central bank using a branch of an R bank as intermediary. So there's a clearing bank that sits between the PBOC and the uh, central bank uh, in whichever country, so Nigeria or South Africa, et cetera. Um, and so PBOC credits that bank's account with the RMB, and that bank then lends the RMB onto the central bank abroad. And then the central bank then lends the, that RMB through the swap line to its own domestic banks, who then in turn lend it, presumably, to their firms for the purpose of trade credit, et cetera. So that's sort of how it works in practice, although the model is quite stylized and, and emits some of those features. Okay, Ricardo, do you have anything to add on that, or shall I move on to the next question? Oh, no, no, okay. Um, we also have a question, what's the impact of uh, exchange rate regimes? So that's sort of discussed uh, in proposition, uh, where is it? Uh, you're going back to the proposition. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess B, discussing, uh, so the lemma 1B, discussing how variation in exchange rates uh, exchange. Uh, or do you want to just, you're, you're waiting your cursor on, you answer the card of it. No, no, you answer. No, I'm just pointing yeah. to illustrate you. We'll do yeah, it yeah sure. So, um, yeah, so part B in, in the lemma here is sort of discussing the role of exchange rate variability. So, obviously, a more stable uh, exchange rate on the uh, RMB side or the R side here helps uh, the use of, uh, of the RMB from the point of view of, of rising that currency up. Uh, and that's actually part of the policies uh, Ricardo listed at the beginning. So, in, in slide, whatever it is, one or two, we discuss the, um, the peg and having, having a stable exchange rate helps. Uh, currency being used, used simply because it sort of stabilizes marginal cost, right? That's that's the idea behind it. Um, yeah, that's the answer there. Uh, fine. So let's scroll down to. I see a question here. Switching to an. I'll answer the next one, Salim, just because. Okay, sure. Catching breath. Switching to an infinite horizon DSG. Essentially, what you'd get is right now, it's kind of you go from, um, you know, here to here, right? What you would do is, you know, if you had then price stickiness, that last several periods, some staggered way, let's say Calvo or something. Um, and likewise, therefore, a staggering of when you could also, you could have then a similar kind of infrequent updating of when you borrow and you work up. So what you'd have is that instead, this rectangle will grow over time, right? Instead of going from the horizontal where it didn't exist to here, you'd have a gradual expansion of this over time, right? So you'd have this effect, you essentially get the dynamics. Now, we initially actually even wrote some of that because we were thinking, oh, maybe we should be trying to explain this effect, meaning how much is the persistence then going on. But then it seemed like, you know, the DSG would take too many pages just to explain why this happens gradually. But I think it's consistent with this happening gradually here. Mm -hmm. The one thing we did empirically, which is along those lines, is precisely the thing I said of the persistence effect. First 12 months is after 12 months, and you see this kind of increasing effect that you can see in the picture, which would be completely consistent with having the dynamic model. Um, essentially, you would have, you'd, you'd have this thing, whether it would be concave or convex, that, again, we'd have to solve the model to know for sure, but you'd have this gradual uh, rise in there. You're an excellent. Okay, fine. So some, some last question. In your model, if a firm uses Chinese inputs, it needs to borrow RMB for working capital, but the firm has the option of borrowing USD and buying RMB in the FX spot market. Uh, seems the choice of input and choice of borrowing currency can be a separate problem from the firm. It can be, and there's uh, a result in the paper. That's the, uh, here that's we go. It's this, this one here uh, that Ricardo's flashed up the slide. Uh, and I think I actually discussed it during the presentation. Basically, there's a very, very strong force that means that the, the firm really wants to align 
uh, the cost of well, the currency of borrowing and, and the um, uh, the currency input is formulated in. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy to show that it wants to do that. It wants to make sure it has the same uh, currency of borrowing and, and the input. Um, that's sort of the sort of result that comes through out of the position here. Um, sure. So there was one, I'm sort of seeing one. Chat. Sure. I think we have one question that we can ask uh, Fadi Hassan to ask live. Sure. Let me yeah. unmute Fadi here. Okay, Fadi, you're unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, sure, thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you, Ricardo and Selim for, for the very nice presentation and paper. Uh, the question is, is more on the empirics. So in the data, there was a strong decline in the share of RMB payments in 2015. But at the same time, you know, the deals, the swap lines were, were increasing. So the question is, was this related to the slowdown of China? And can you somehow use it to understand better, you know, the interaction between the real side and the financial side of your mechanism, which I think is, is, is quite interesting. So that's, that's the question, basically. Yeah, so I, I just put here the picture. So just, Fadi, it's exactly what you're saying, right? It's the fall of the blue line, even though red keeps on increasing, just, just to illustrate that. Um, let me, I'll, I'll do a, one very brief answer and then Salim will touch in, which is note that after 2015, very few swap lines have been signed, right? So our force for blue to increase is gone. Now, of course, if everything that was going on, if that was the only variation that's relevant to the data, our model, let's say, would predict that blue should be flat, not rising, right? Because there's only two swap lines got signed here after 2015. Uh, the bulk of it can be for. Now, why does blue fall instead of being, uh, in being steady? Empirically, I don't know because that's in my time fixed effects, obviously, right? So the regressions themselves don't inform on that, don't, don't tell me on that. Um, I think, you know, there's two bits here. Uh, so let me conjecture, therefore, on two things. First is, like you said, trade with China, the slowdown of China's economy may have contributed a little bit. Again, that wouldn't necessarily explain the fall as opposed to why doesn't it not keep on rising, right? So if you have slowdown in trade and no new swap lines and no other measure, not just the swap lines, there's essentially been no relevant measure of internationalization of the RMB in the sense of our G distributions after 2016. So nothing pushing that up. Trade isn't pushing it up. So, but now, a second thing, which I think is relevant, and that's actually very important so far as I didn't discuss enough in the empirics, is that, you know, this is the date when the IMF included the RMB uh, in the SDR basket. So there's a very important null hypothesis, which is the null hypothesis of zero effect is actually important for our work. Why? I think, you know, and we talked to, I guess I shouldn't say names, but many people as I was starting this project and was chatting with a lot of people, me and Salim, uh, especially on the policy angle, on do you think the swap lines, what do they do? And we have this very strong hypothesis, oh, they did nothing. Essentially, the swap lines were nothing but some posturing for including, for the inclusion in the SDR. Once the, the, China, once the RMB got included in the SDR basket, eh, they stopped signing so many swap lines. That was the political goal. That impetus was gone. And therefore, the RMB then was steady. That the, if you wanted the PBOC, ultimately, and all the measures weren't really about the um, RMB usage. They were just about getting into the SDR basket. And, that's, and the RMB usage was just an intermediate way to get there. So our regressions, right, reject that super strongly, right? That would be the null hypothesis where our coefficient beta would be zero. It seems that the swap lines increase the RB, there weren't just political posturing. It wasn't just about the SDR. But when you're talking about why this fall, when swap lines are in there, that effect of trying to get the SDR that's then gone, and thus all the other potential policies that are being used, they stop being used, and that may be also part of why it fell. Salim, do you want to add something? Uh, um, let me say one thing about this, this picture, which is more of a, it's something we should work better on, is that actually a lot of the, the variation in, in across like the total RMB share is driven by the countries that uh, are financial centers like the UK for instance would be a, is a much bigger part of global payments than it is as a part of um, say global economy and the same for the US for instance and so part of the fluctuation you're seeing here is what's happening in in those countries because they really drive the total amount of payments that are happening across the whole world it's like a wasted average as opposed to simple average if you look at a simple average, it's, it's, not, it's not the same. You don't have the sort of, uh, same sort of flattening. Um, and maybe we should actually present that, that picture instead, just, just thinking about now, given what you said. Um, and that's, that's, that's something we should work on. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to... So yes, in terms so, of question, 
you want to chip in? Yeah, go ahead. We have, we have about uh, four more minutes. I just want everyone to know that if you asked a question, we're not necessarily going to be able to get to all the questions, but uh, they will be given to the authors. Uh, the next question will come from uh, Matteo Maggiore, actually. So, Matteo, uh, you should be good to go. Yeah, I mean, Ricardo, first of all, and, and Salim, great paper, and thank you for agreeing to be the inaugural speaker. I think it was very interesting. It's a topic that doesn't receive uh, nearly as much economic analysis. Um, I wanted to understand a little bit the mechanics of, of the swaps. And suppose that I live in an extreme world where the, I cannot get hold of Remimbi because they have capital controls. Um, and to make a payment, you need to first give me some of your currency. Uh, in that sense, it would be, um, through that, uh, giving me a swap line, it's a way to uh, get going, but it's almost sort of mechanical. Uh, there was no other way for me to make a payment uh, if you didn't give me some of your currency first. Um, is that right? Is that wrong? How, how do you think about that? I'll give a very short answer, and then I think Salim has more to say. But uh, note, Matteo, that the way the swap line works is it's not that Pakistan, say, signs a swap line and can go to the, and, and can just say, give me lots of RMB China. Or, well, they can, but that's not the way it's mostly used. The way it's mostly used is there's a guy in Pakistan, a firm, who's already borrowing RMB. They go and discount that loan at the, at the Pakistan Central Bank, and then Pakistan goes and gets the RMB. Okay, so there was already a lending of RMB to start with. So now you start from scratch. Let me right away put a presence. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way that, again, when we talk to officials, they would like it to work. That's the way the contract is signed. Having said that, let me immediately open the parenthesis and say that's not what Argentina did when it borrowed a lot of RMB from the from uh, from the PBOC using the swap line just to get um, uh, just to get uh, some RMB in order to defend its peg with a dollar. But at least in um, theory, as well as in for most of the practice, Matteo, you've already you're discounting an existing RMB loan um, when you use the swap line. So there's already an RMB credit to start with. Salim, you know more? Also. Yeah, let me just add this, this on operational perspective. I think that's what you were sort of asking. How do you get the money in, in the first place? So the swap line doesn't open up a, a payment system, right? It still goes through the same um, structure that exists already to make RMB payments. It relies on a clearing bank, typically in, in Hong Kong, um, and so that, that claim back must exist and it must be willing to give the central bank an RMB deposit uh, and that central bank must be willing to lend on the RMB and, and so on and so forth. And so what SwapLine does basically is it just cheapens the cost of credit as it were by enabling the clearing bank to get RMB more cheaply uh, from the PBOC. So that's sort of the, the sort of operational perspective. So the actual pipes must all be in, in, in place for the money to flow. Now, you could say that, oh, without the swap line at all, there's no chance you could borrow an RMB, uh, and therefore that's what's happening. You're just you're basically just removing a complete you know, uh, constraint on RMB borrowing altogether. It's not, not a cost thing. But that, that seemed perhaps a little bit too extreme, I think. And Matthew, Thank you. That was uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, and Matthew, one, you use this yeah. whether there's a clearing bank. That was, remember one of these controls that I told you about? Because again, that's when you put the pipe uh, to let the thing work. Those are these controls you have on these clearing banks. One suggestion I had was it would be lovely to know more about when the piping essentially starts, because that's another way to get the currency going. Is you need to lay the piping, and it'd be I think it'd be interesting uh, in, in addition to being a control to just I agree. That's fantastic. So yeah, this is the thing I highlighted. We have the data on whether the country and when it had an RMB clearing bank. So using that the environment itself. That actually, to me, that isn't a very interesting variable because Hong Kong does all the work for this. So, I mean, a bank in Nigeria can always go to its Hong Kong correspondent and get the RMB. So the piping is really about the Hong Kong market, and that was open in 2009, the CNH market, basically. Oh, that's um, right. And that's what, that's what Ricardo sort of said at the very beginning as well. So that's, that's sort of the key pipe. These RMB clearing banks, they, they, I think they are symbolic, actually. The one in London is an empty, empty shell. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the Hong Kong market really matters. 